Spanish people and then French people arrive in our shores. Uh, a bit like over here in, in the Aotearoa as well in the 18th century. And uh, very quickly in 1815, our main island, Tahiti, but also the kingdom of Tahiti and her islands. Uh, Uh, person that came to Tahiti, which is really funny. Uh, but we also have uh, some Ali'i yeah, in Tahiti, the Tewa clan especially, and also have Tamatoa clan in the Leeward Islands, where I come from, personally. Uh, anyway, <laughs> the dynasty was, was finally unified under uh, Tuamutugai, and then the lineage continued, and then our country was ceded, uh, f firstly, uh, uh, placed under a forced French protectorate status uh, in 1842 uh, under a treaty, uh, which it was our queen, Pomare IV, and then uh, annexed formally as a French colony on the 29th of June, uh, 1880, which was a very sad day to us. Oops, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, since that point on, it was only uh, concern, the treaty of annexation only concerned Tahiti and her island, and not the rest of Maui Nui. Today is Maui Nui. So uh, between 1880 uh, to 1901, uh, other islands under indigenous kingdoms uh, were subsequently annexed and incorporated under France, and and actually uh, named the French establishment of Oceania. You see, it was worse than French Polynesia, I know, but uh, this was the first name that we've been given. Uh, it was like a, a trade, trade place for European uh, in the Pacific region that would stop by the estab French establishment Oceania, then going to the right or to the left. That was the concept uh, of, uh, of Tahiti that time. Uh, the, a very quick colonial history now, uh, starting from 1947 after World War II. Uh, the UN, United Nations, has been uh, founded and created in 1946, uh, August uh, 46, and then the year after, well, that, that, at that period, the UN, uh, it was not, uh, there was not 183 state members at the beginning, 51 if I, if I, I or, if you correct me if I'm wrong, 51, France was composing the fund because of, they were the winners. They were the, they've been the winner of the World War II at that time. And uh, they've been, all, all the, the powers at the beginning were requested to, uh, you know, submit a list of, of possessions, of territories that they had, their empire, their power, throughout the world. And of course, the est French establishment of Oceania were on the list, same as, uh, same as New Caledonia, Vanuatu, I'm talking about French side, and also some African countries, Corsica, Mayotte, and others. And the Caribbean region too, like Martinique, Guadeloupe, French Guyana. And uh, the, uh, the year after, they didn't wait that long, the year after, the French ambassador sent a message to uh, the Secretary General of the UN, Secretary General of the UN, uh, to say that they will stop transmit, some transmitting information about their possessions. Because uh, in 1946, France actually has changed its own constitution and replaced the language uh, French colonies as French territories, overseas territories. So they created the concept of overseas territories and overseas department. The overseas territories were the one that could be on the list uh, and someday will be willing to become independent, whereas the other side, the, the overseas department, were like the state in the United States, like they are incorporated within the French Republic since the beginning. So at least we've been on the other side. Uh, the, uh, but we've been delisted uh, from from the UN list uh, for the reason for that reason, because only uh, the term colony was not acceptable for the French in, in 1946, and for that reason, 
1963, there was no vote from the UN General Assembly. Uh, we've been administratively uh, delisted uh, by sort of an update process uh, of the Secretary General Office managing uh, all these territories at the time. And then we've just, okay, there's no information about Maui Nui. I call Maui Nui today. Okay, let's put them out. That was the deal. That was the deal. But the real deal was to allow France to seek for a place to establish its nuclear testing program. Uh, so it was on purpose. Uh, it was not like something that they, an omission uh, from them. Of course not. Uh, because, uh, yeah. Uh, in 1958, there has been a referendum uh, to again change the French constitution. They already changed it in 1946, replacing the terms colony by overseas territories. And then in 1958, there was a referendum to like put a big update on all the, the French possessions, but without the scrutiny of the UN. And uh, there has been a consultation all over French Republic territories, inhabitants, let's say, citizens, to say, to, to seek whether or not they will be okay with that new document, uh, uh, which to us shows that any constitutional process is very sensitive uh, in, our, in our case. Uh, and then for military reason and pressure, and also economic pressure, uh, our population voted yes to that consultation. Unfortunately, even though the political leaders at that time pushed for a no, we actually, he actually was arrested. He was sent to jail and then sent to France, exiled for eight years, like punishment, and then for, uh, through a false, uh, I would say, motives. Uh, and then he was already, he was just actually, uh, what you call, the sentence was canceled last year after 60 years of arrestation and his memory was just released last year, having the one acting for his process, his new trial for decades. Uh, and then it took them actually 60 years to recognize that the judgment was false, wrongly motivated. But they won the referendum at that time. You see, you see the, the, the process is really, is really interesting uh, under the French perspective. Uh, actually, and then that yes from French Polynesia and also from the Canucks, uh people was falsely interpreted as an act of self-determination. Actually, it was just to say if you're okay with the document or not. But the pressure was if you're not okay, you're out from the French Republic. So all, everybody in French Polynesia, Maui Nui, was afraid and scared about, okay, what's, what is this about? So they all voted yes. They arrested our leaders, the first leaders. Uh, uh, independentist, autonomist, they say. And then they, after the winning of the yes, they interpreted this decision as a yes to stay France, to stay French. So they actually uh, just jeopardized our, 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 our will at that time. Uh, I'm coming, I'm going forward, yep. And the year after, you see, everything was expedited very quickly. Uh, there has been an executive order taken by the French President de Gaulle. Uh, I don't know why everybody wants a love to the President de Gaulle in France, but he's a criminal to us. He's a criminal. I will say why. Because he's the actor, the first initiator of the French nuclear testing program. Uh, this is the first criminal uh, that should, you know, that should be known everywhere. But the, the love, the political class in France, they really love that man. Uh, okay, for us, he took a decision, an executive order, to, to declare all radioactive and strategic raw material under state government control. You know, uh, women and the coconuts and the beach sands and all these things, you will play ukulele probably like here in, in, in Hawaii for years, for decades, without knowing what was radioactive and strategic raw material. They knew that already since the beginning. Of course, uh, they control the radioactive, then the nuclear uh, industry, and still today they are selling their their plants uh, all around the world, making money uh, with with the uh, the approval of the political class in Paris. But we didn't know the second the second language 
The second uh, pillar of that decree was strategic raw materials. You know, today, this industry represents the digital age. Everything that is composed by screen, LCD, and everything else is, is just comes from rare earth, uh, strategic metals. And that uh, it was not the, under the knowledge of the French, the, the Tahitians at that time, but they already knew what they've been doing by, by putting this. Uh, and that decree is it, it's the spirit of that decree, that colonial decree is still existing today under all different statutes that has been voted for Maui Nui, French Polynesia, uh, since uh, from Paris. We cannot change that. Uh, and there's a purpose. 85% of the uh, percent of the trade and the industry of rare earth today is is under control of China. And then uh, European Union is just seeking how to find a way or to figure out how they will be more uh, or less dependent from that trade, and the more and more that uh, the, the, the exploitation of strategic raw materials of our planet uh, will be at the forefront of the next uh, of the industry. This is already uh, the case, but uh, I'll, I'll show you what I show you why this is important for me to put this in my slide. Uh, okay, 30 years of different states of, of so-called autonomy. Uh, that was voted by Paris, but the unilateral authority of France remains until today. Uh, uh, some people still believe that we are, we are a free country, we can do what we want, uh, we can govern ourselves democrati democratically, uh, which is not true. Uh, 2003, constitution revision. Again, another constitutional revision. You might understand again yeah. why this is a sensitive case for any constitutional issue is now, what, what is this? <laughs> uh, to us, to us. Uh, so uh, that constitution, that revision uh, basically replaced and or canceled the language peoples. Overseas people was replaced by the language overseas population. It means that we no longer are qualified to, to claim for the implementation of anything that deals with the language people. So we're no longer indigenous people. We're a population of a French Republic, which has only one people. Uh, so under, the, under the, the meaning of the French constitution, uh, it was very harmful for us because uh, finally in 2007, when the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People was successfully uh, adopted, uh, France didn't have any reluctance <laughs> to sign it, to ratify it, or to implement it, because there was only one or two indigenous people in its own constitution, the Canucks and the Wallis and Futunis. But the rest was French, popul French people. So pff, it was okay for them. Uh, so, and they changed their constitution too to recognize the Canucks, which means that when you want to claim any indigeneity, under the meaning of the French constitution, you need to ask them to change their constitution. Uh, look, look, you know, it's very, it's very interesting uh, to, to know that. Uh, and then uh, after uh, 40 years, let's say 35 years of struggle, uh, after one local government overthrown, <laughs> we, we, we process, uh, under, and with the French, with the support, sorry, very strong support of the churches, especially the Maui Protestant churches, church in, in, in Tahiti. And uh, the, the Pacific Conference of Churches, which is the level upper, the upper levels, and then, and then the World Council of Churches, we, uh, I must say also with the women, International League for Freedom and Peace, uh, I have to mention that too, uh, we successfully uh, relisted Maui Nui, French Polynesia, as a territory, a non-self-governing territories, it's important to, to notice that, on the list of uh, the United Nations, the same list that we've been delisted from back then in 47, 19, 1947, no, 1947. So the, the only difference is that we've been delisted without any resolution. 
from the GA, from the, from the international community. Whereas in 2013, it was an, uh, a, an, a resolution. It was adapted by consensus uh, without the presence of our colonial power in the room. Uh, they moved out. They didn't want to accept that. They want to, to recognize that, uh, that event. Anyway, in terms of the international law, in terms of the UN Charter, in terms of the Declaration of, of Decolonization uh, 1540, 1540 or 1541, all the subsequent declarations, uh, we became, we've been recognized as a non-self-governing territories, which means that we are recognized the right of inal inalienable right of self-determination within the meaning of the Charter and no longer within the meaning of the French Constitution, which was completely, which is completely different. The French Constitution did not, does, does not allow us to speak at the UN. The UN Charter and this relisting allows us not every, every, every year, you, we ask our badge, this is an example of badge, your petitioner, where are you from? French Polynesia, Mauhinu? Yes, okay, this is your badge, you have the floor. Whereas for 40 years or 60 years, we've been delisted. We have no rights. You stay outside from the UN. You just yell or just march, anything, but no voice inside the, 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 big, the big arena. In 2016, uh, France uh, also in the UN, uh, the UN General Assembly urged, and the language is important, urged uh, our colonial power to ensure the sovereignty of the people of French Polynesia over all their or our natural resources in the air, in the ocean, on the land, on the seabed, and in the, in the, on the on spatial zone, everywhere that uh, is concerned by Te Maui. This is very important uh, because it, it, it actually hits back the decision, the decree taken by President de Gaulle in 1959, if you remember. Uh, so it's a now that decision of 1959 is a violation of the international law. Uh, we have a pressure now. It's, it, it, mean, it means completely a different thing. And this is very, I, I know you understand that, uh, because it gives us another leverage. But I have to mention that there was another violation, an aggra another aggression that has been... Uh, uh, I would say, imposed by the colonial power, uh, by France. And then one of the biggest challenges that we faced was this 193 uh, shot explosions. Uh, and there were 46 in the air, uh, just up of the atoll, the two atolls of Morurua and Fongataufa in the Tuamotu Islands. And all our country was contaminated in the air. It's proven. It's proven, it's now even recognized by the administering power. It's recognized upon since the reinscription. It was not possible to have it recognized that fact before, but now there's no way they can, they can deny it. So they passed some laws in Paris in the chambers, Senate or the National Assembly to try to put some compensation process, but at least they recognized that. For us, it's not just a violation, it's a crime against humanity. It's very important to mention that. A communication has been submitted by our party, Tavini Huida Atira, uh, the, the only ruling sovereignty party, not the ruling, the dominant sovereignty party in Mauhinui, uh, uh, before the, the Bureau of the Prosecutor of uh, the uh, International Criminal Court in The Hague, Netherlands. Uh, to qualify this period, this act uh, of, of uh, health aggressions, environmental aggressions as crimes against humanity. Uh, the population of Mauhinui, uh, you will you'll notice the blue, mar marine blue is those who are aged uh, between zero to 30. So 61%, uh, I'm sorry for the, uh, uh, for the, the, the numbers, uh, it's roughly 61% of the population that is aged under 30, uh, which, is our, these are, which means that these are the ones that we need to convince. 
of the relevantness of our, of our struggle uh, after, then now that we are relisted. In terms of ethnicity, uh, the non maori people represent roughly 25%, which means that we're still 75%, including all Tuamutu, Marcuses, Tahiti, and the Leeward Islands, and, uh, and of course, the Australs. Uh, there's hope, but it's not necessarily, that's an advent, uh, when you see that, it's an advantage, but it's not necessary, necessary that all are okay with the decolonization process, but there's hope, because we're still speaking our language. There are sev seven languages in the Tuamutu Islands, that we not necessarily understand from Tahiti. There are two different languages in the Marquesas Island. There's one uh, particular I uh, language in the Leeward Islands, Maupiti, and there are two different languages in the Australs. Uh, so it means that we have plenty of, you know, <laughs> I will say potential uh, in terms of culture, in terms of uh, the recognition of what who we are. Uh, so it's not a matter of identity. It, the matter now, the, the, the real issue now is to convince all this 75%, including those non maori people that we include, that the economic model that we want to, 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 to submit, to propose, to advocate is viable. We have a resource. We've been trained to just say yes to France. We've been all even conditioned. We put in a box to say that we cannot live without that. And because of the style, of the profile of the colonization that we've been imposed, uh, it's a very weird and interesting uh, style. <laughs> because everybody knows that colonization is roughly something that comes from a big colonial power, a big power, a big country that wants to, uh, a greedy one, <laughs> that wants to uh, just possess. And possess to do on this small territories, what they're not daring to do in their own. That's roughly uh, colonization. So there's an intent, possessions, and those, there's also a process, how to, how to manipulate people so that they will love you. And this is what happened. Uh, roughly, the, 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 the French style of colonization is to make people understand that uh, we've been into the darkness for 2,000 years, and that they sent us the light. And so we've been really, really dark people. And, sent, and because of that, they saved us. <laughs> it was a humanitarian mission. Uh, and of course, we've been there, uh, some of us, uh, <laughs> and still, in the, even in the political class of today, uh, just falling into that trap, not wanting to stay out of the box. Uh, but the, the, new, the, style, the new style of colonization uh, today is a as a contemporary one, because it's no longer only to, to possess other territories and small dependencies, but it's also to use their resources to sustain your own one without using, using yours. Uh, no, matter if, no, matter, no matter how you still have resources or not, it's just like making economy <laughs> just and savings, not using yours, but using the ones that actually uh, belongs to the people of the territory that you possess. And this is neo-colonization. Uh, and, and, and when you combine the two cases, then you will find Maui people, Maui UN dossier. This is what actually it's all about, because our dossier of UN decolonization, our process, is combining both. And this is, and this is important, because this was one of the arguments we succeeded. If we came before all the authorities of the UN to to put them some nostalgia about the DNA of the UN, like saying just to, 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 the, to them that, okay, self-determination, we are people, we need to, 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 to be heard, it would not necessarily convince them as much as we could have. Uh, because we've, we've been there and we explained to them that we have a, we have a nation to build, we have an econ a model, economic model, we will, we will implement our model to fit in our views to the, what the world of today is, is living. And, and we, we need to enter the UN family, not because we are a former dependency of France, but because we have five million square kilometers of economy of ocean, but because we have so, such a seabed, mine, seabed resources potential in our, in our zone, because we have a, 
a country to, to govern because we have another family finally in the Pacific that we need to join back because it, we, it has no sense for us just to become independent, to stay Maori people. We want to be Maori people and, in, and be independent to get more interdependency with the Pacific region. That's what the process is all about. And then it convinced the majority of the UN uh, of, of the relevant relevance of our Okay, I'll be, I'll be short on this, but this is important. Uh, if you want to understand the, the, the colonial relationship between uh, Paris and uh, Tahiti, Tahiti because this is where the government is, the legislator, legislator too, uh, on the left side, you have the different powers, the different areas, sectors, where the colonial powers is still implemented and controlled. Defense, army, foreign affairs, police, justice, immigration, customs, currency, the legislation of land, the communication, especially the audiovisual, the banking system, university, and the strategic raw materials as of today, even though it's a violation now of the, of the, of the UN resolution concerning Maui Nui. And then you also have the communes. It means that are they actually there to create some cities, communes controlled by colonial powers, and they use sort of a democracy uh, to divide us locally, uh, like uh, they are just subdelegating the power to a to below be, uh, 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 to a level that is more uh, close to the people, but actually they are actually executing French power and not Maui Hinui local government power. So it's actually two against one, <laughs> because on the right side, on the right side, we've been actually left at the, uh, areas that we that are just uh, it's like we're working, and the money is on the left, but the work is on the left. Of course, what's on the right is actually the government of today: education, employment, land tenure, tourism, economy, social welfare marine management, agriculture, sport, and so on. But when you go, and you go through any of each, sorry, of the area on the right side, you can go further than what is decided on the left. Just one example, education. Education. Uh, we manage our own education, but the whole system is paid by France to pay for that. It means that we are even though we decide what we teach, uh, when they uh, send their professors from Paris or elsewhere, from New York, they cannot change it because they are the one that pay for that. Uh, another example, and I will stop then, uh, tourism. I know this is a sensitive state for Hawaii too, but still Alaska is paying. But this is on purpose. We've been isolated because even though we're managing tourism, the management of tourism of uh, today excludes the visa system. So they are deciding from Paris who are allowed to come to Tahiti or not. So it means that when France is not okay with any country in the world that we don't even know who, what it is in Tahiti, we never will never see their people. It means that, okay, you're like, you're managing, we are managing tourism, but, <laughs> but we don't know where the tourists are coming from unless it's from the USA or from you. Okay, I'm already almost done. I would like to just finish by saying, uh, reasserting the reason that we, uh, sorry, just to very quickly, why we are doing this. Why is it so important? And what motivates us? <laughs> we, we've chosen the difficult and but respectable path to our full sovereignty, independence, full sovereignty, because we have a vision and because we believe that deserve dignity like that as a country. We are Polynesian people belonging to a Pacific family representing one third of the globe. We're not something uh, in, the, in the Pacific region. We have a few future, we have a nation to build real in our hand. We need to be skilled, get prepared, 
and we have a sustainable and cooperation and development model to feed and protect our people. If the UN accepted to release us, it was back that it was that they trust us in the future of our country. They would never have dared to bring to release us if it was just for us.
does this thing want to go? Yeah, okay. So it's, it's really important to grasp the fact that constitutions are cultural creations. Each culture knows how it makes its own rules for its own culture. They are not things that must come out of Europe. That notion that constitutions can only come out of Europe is just white supremacy. That's all that is. Every single culture has its own way of doing things. Now, if you have a look, I'm going to compare a Western concept with a Maori concept. The Western concept in sight of power is one that's quite hierarchical. You have sovereignty, which is the most high and perpetual power over citizens. And you have the sight of power being the monarch in parliament with absolute authority and dominion over the land and people. And that's what you've got in England, it's what you've got in Europe. Okay? Whereas if you have a look at the Māori concept and sight of power, our concept of power is mana. That absolute power and authority derived from the gods that we understand very clearly. The sight of power is our ariki or our rangatira, our leaders. So where it's a, a parliament in the Western world, it's vested in our leaders in the Māori world, and it's the power bestowed by the people to be exercised in a way that is tika. So you ask your leaders to be your leaders provided they do it in a way that is tikka. Now, tikka means what is right, what is correct, what is the proper way to do things. And tikka and puno are very closely related for us in Māori. And puno, I understand, is what our, your, our word tikka is. So, and it makes decisions by consensus. For us, consensus is hugely important because if you have... 49, 48, 47% of the people not agreeing and refusing to agree with a decision, you have a hard job dealing with those people because they're always going to be opposed. Whereas if you have consensus where the decision is agreed to, then everybody owns the decision and you can move ahead without having to deal with that. We spend a lot of time trying to reach consensus. Um, and we'll, we'll put off meetings and re-hold re meetings in order to get consensus. It cares for the people. The people, are, we often say, the most important thing in the world is people and keeping the people together and caring for them. And that you keep the people together. Our word rangatira there, ariki and rangatira, the word rangatira actually means somebody who keeps the people together. Now, in order to keep the people together, one, you've got to have their confidence, you've got to have the authority that they've given them, but you've got to have the resources to keep your people together as well. Uh, and then there is the independence of the hapu and iwi, so that if a hapu makes a decision, no other hapu can override that decision. If an iwi makes a decision, nobody can override that decision, the independence. So you can see two, just within two comparisons there, totally different constitutional um, models within those two cultures. Now, the foundations that we were going to build it on, first of all, and I've already covered this, so the tikanga, or our own laws, our hakaputanga or te rangatiratanga or new tirini is our 1835 Declaration of Sovereignty. That, uh, that it was a document um, written by the, the rangatira of the north, the, the leaders of the north saying that sovereignty lay within the hapu, not within the iwi, within the hapu. Uh, then the 1840 Tiriti o Waitangi, the treaty we had with the British, but we also, for the constitutional transformation purposes, looked at these international measures. Uh, the Zakarioki uh, Oka decision declaration of 1992, which was the inalienable rights to lands, territories, resources, and water. 
And these were all around um, United Nations uh, work that was being done. The Matatua Declaration of 1993 on Cultural and Intellectual Property Rights. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which of course we all know was finally went through the General Assembly in uh, 2007, opposed by the Kansas countries, by Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. Now, every single one of those countries in the end had to support that declaration. Reluctantly, in New Zealand's case, they did it in 2010 after the United States, that was Barack Obama, who enabled that, uh, and then Australia and Canada and New Zealand had no choice. They had to follow. But the, that declaration is hugely threatening to the New Zealand government. See, France doesn't have indigenous people, so it doesn't threaten France. Pie, cunning, all right. <laughs> anyway, all framed within the right to self-determination. So that's what we, the foundation we had to base it on. We also looked at the Sami uh, in Scandinavia. Uh, we looked at Bolivia. And Bolivia was a model that we really looked quite closely at. And we're quite afraid of what's happening in Bolivia at the moment. Uh, and then the Native American um, examples where sovereignty is sort of recognized for several um, uh, nations within, uh, of Native Americans. The Sami warned us when they heard that we were working off theirs, they warned us not to use theirs as a model because theirs leaves, uh, the one in Norway, the Sami parliament in Norway, leaves the Norwegian government with a right of veto <coughs> over the Sami parliament, which is a complete, it defeats the whole purpose of the parliament. Uh, all right, now the values. This is what our people spent the most time on, was the values. And what they said was, if we get the underlying values right, the rest of it will flow from it. The value of tikanga, to relate to or incorporate the core ideas and the ought to be of living in Aotearoa. Now this is about, tikanga is about, it is our laws, but it is the right way to do things. Now, you have to determine what is the right way to do things. And we all have very good ideas about what is right. And what the people said as we went round is they said, but yeah, we know what's right, but we often don't do that. So what are we going to do about that? And Wana said, you will, must always hold a standard up there that you know is right, even if you don't always meet it, you must have it there so that you know what to aim for. And that's what you should set for your value of tikanga, is what you ought to be doing. And that's why he called it the ought to be uh, of living in Aotearoa. The value of community, to facilitate the fair representation and good relationships between all peoples. Now this is extremely important for us because as I said before, we are mana whenua. We are responsible for all of our manuhiri, all of our visitors who come in, and we must make sure that they're all well looked after, that they all get on with each other and get on with us. Even when they're mean to us and horrible to us, we're still responsible for them, being able to live good lives. Uh, the value of belonging, to foster a sense of belonging for everyone in the community because many communities in New Zealand feel alienated. Uh, it's, it's not, mostly it's um, non-whites who are alienated, they're discriminated against, racial discrimination is really bad in New Zealand, but it's also our youth, our women, our LGBTIQ+, our, our gay people, um, our disabled people, they're all marginalised. And that, we, we made sure that we asked those people if they wanted us to come and talk to them, and they all did. They all wanted us to come and talk to them and said, we want to be a part of the community. So that's why this being able to belong was very, very important. The value of place. 
Now, this is to promote relationships with and ensure the protection of Papatua Nuku, which is... <laughs> it's our Mother Earth. Now, we took this out of the um, Bolivian Constitution, where their first law is the law of Pachamama, who is Papatua Nuku, Mother Earth. And it's really simple. Without Mother Earth, none of us would be here. And if you don't look after her, none of us are going to be here. So you must look after her. And that's something that is really fundamental to Māori ways of thinking anyway. You don't look after your mother, you're gone. So the value of place. Then the value of balance. And that's that logo I showed you at the beginning. To ensure respect for the authority of rangatiratanga, that sovereignty or power and authority that Māori were guaranteed would always be ours, and the kāwanatanga that was delegated to the British to look after their own. That you must have a balance between those two authorities within the different and relational spheres of influence, and I'll talk to you about those spheres of influence uh, when I get down to the vision. The value of conciliation. This is something that my old people used to often shake their heads and say, why does the white man always have to have a winner and a loser? You do not have to do it that way. To have an underlying jurisdictional base and means of resolution to guarantee a conciliatory and consensual democracy rather than an adversarial and majoritarian one. So where you have a problem you sit down and you work it out. You don't run to the court where the judge says, you win, you lose. And you, the loser, will pay you the winner. All that does is lead to ongoing animosity, uh, disharmony, and that sort of thing. Our old people have always said, if you have a problem, you must sort it out in such a way that after the problem is resolved, you can all still to live together and live together happily. But if you're going to have winners and losers, you're never going to have people living together happy, happily. So conciliation. The value of structure. To have structural conventions that promote basic democratical ideas, ideals of fair representation, openness, and transparency. At the moment, in New Zealand, we often don't know what goes on inside our government departments, inside of our parliament. There is no openness. Everything is secret. They'll tell you only what they want to tell you. There is no way for a people to have any confidence in what is going on in your country. So those are the values. Now, out of those values and, and all of the um, recommendations and what our people were asking for, we were supposed to build one model. Right. Well, we couldn't build one model. We built six. Because we had to be able to, uh, to um, cater for everything our people had asked for. So the first model, uh, you, you've got three what we call tricameral models where you've got three parts to your structure. You'd have your tinoranga tiratanga sphere. Now, in that sphere, Māori would make decisions for Māori, for Māori resources, for anything Māori would be made there. It would be quite separate and independent of the kāwanatanga sphere where the Crown and the government is now. Our people had nothing to say, really, about what the shape of the Crown would be, what the structure of the Crown would be. The only thing they had to say about the Crown was they are to have no responsibility and no right to have any say over anything Māori. That belonged in the te Tiratanga sphere. Now, where the two of those overlap, you come together in a third body with, with representatives from each of the two going into a third joint deliberative body that we called the relational sphere. So elect people out of the tinoranga tiratanga sphere, out of the kāwanatanga sphere, into the relational sphere. That's where you deal with matters that, that affect both Māori and non-Māori. 
but Māori issues in the Tinoranga Tiratanga sphere, non Māori issues in the Kawanatanga sphere. Okay? That's the first model. Now, in the Tinoranga Tiratanga sphere, your representatives would come out of iwi and hapu. Whereas in the second tricameral model, you'd have your representation in the Rangatiratanga sphere coming out of iwi, hapu, and urban representation. And I couldn't fit it all on the slide, but it would be all those other groups that need to be represented, like the disabled, the youth, the women, the LGBTQ+, uh, all of those representation would be to cover all of those. The Crown, we leave the Crown to do what it wants to do. You'd still have a joint uh, deliberative body called the relational sphere. In the third tricameral model, you would have the same things operating in the rangatiratanga sphere and the kawanatanga sphere, but in the relational sphere, rather than it being a national body, you would do it in the regions. So that would probably be about 10 regions around the country. Uh, then there was a fourth model that was a multi-sphere model. And the reason for this is that Many hapu and iwi have their own agreements with the Crown that they've negotiated over the last century or so. Not, uh, they want to preserve those, and so we had to have a model that would accommodate those agreements that are already in place and wouldn't wipe them out. So that's that central box, the mana motuhake, where you've got iwi, hapu, Crown already got a relationship in there that you want to preserve. Um, other than that, it's all the same as the tricameral. Now, because logically you had to include this, you had to have a unicameral model where you only had one body. Uh, and so that would be the relational sphere. You'd have your iwi, your hapu, and your crown in the one body. Hmm. We put it in because it had to go in there logically. People did not like it because that's what we have at the moment. They didn't want it. Uh, it's one body making decisions together. Now, the last one is a possible bicameral model with two bodies. The rangatiratanga sphere and the, sorry, oh, flip that past. Rangatiratanga sphere and the kawanatanga sphere quite separate from each other. The key thing with these is they've got to learn to talk to each other. Now, the reason for this is because people felt that if they appointed representatives to a third body, they lost control of their people when they went into that third body. And it would tend to be dominated by the kawanatanga side of it because that's the nature of Europeans. They've got to be in charge. Mm -hmm. So this seems to be the favoured model at the moment where we preserve our right to make our decisions for ourselves, but we'll talk to the government when we need to talk about things that we have in common. Okay? Now, the recommendations that were made, from 2016 on, there would be discussion amongst Māori. There has been a huge amount of discussion, um, to the point now that I go to Hui and I hear I never thought I would hear Māori talking constitutional transformation because those are complicated English words. Well, I was wrong. And especially our young ones. They keep coming into the huis and saying, we must have constitutional transformation. I'm looking at them and thinking, do you know what that means? And they keep talking about the right to make their own decisions about their own lives. Government, get out of our faces and leave us alone and stop telling us what to do. Yeah, you know what constitutional transformation's about. Okay. Annual agenda item on national uh, hui of lead Māori organisations. Uh, certainly in national iwi chairs forum, it's not an annual agenda item. We meet four times a year and at every single one of those meetings I report on the um, constitutional transformation and how it's going. That we would have a Māori constitutional convention in 2021 and that would be to bring all Māori together having had time to think about 
what is needed for constitutional transformation and to start making decisions about which model are we going to use. Uh, well, when I reminded National Iwi Chairs Forum that that was what we had agreed to, these recommendations back in 2016, I said that to them in November, a few months ago. They said, why do we have to wait till 2021? The people know what this stuff is. Why can't we do it now in 2020? And I'm going, ah, oh, um, okay. And I rang up Moana and he goes, well, why not? So we will probably do that this year. And the reason that a lot of National Iwi Chairs Forum was saying that is because it's an election year in New Zealand this year, okay? So, yeah, good on, that's smart, all right. <laughs> Establish a working group to work out the structural and procedural issues for Māori. We haven't done anything on that formally yet, but what has happened is our, we've got a lot of young Māori lawyers, judges, who are saying to us, come on, we need to do this structural stuff. And when I go back uh, in the middle of February, a group of lawyers has asked us to meet to start talking about this stuff. So it's, it's not Mateke Mai Aotearoa asking for it, it's others outside asking to do the work. Um, Māori initiate dialogue with other communities. Well, we didn't have to, they came to us. The first ones who came were Cook Islanders, um, particularly the Rarotongans, those from Aitutaki, those from Moke, came to talk to us to ask us, can we please be part of the rangatiratanga side of it? They, they got it straight away. And can we be please be a part of it? And we said, well, you want to abide by tikanga and live by tikanga? Fine. I have to say some Pākehas asked if they could do it as well. And we said, you want to live by tikanga? That's fine. But if you don't want to live by tikanga, you want to live by Pākehā law, you go over the other side. Uh, so, and it wasn't just the Pacific community, so Cook Islands and then Tonga, Samoa, our biggest Pacific Island community in New Zealand is Samoans, and then Tongans, they came to us as well, but also the Chinese and Indian communities came to us as well, asking to be part of it. Um, Iwi hapu and lead Māori organisations initiate dialogue with the Crown. Well, uh, yeah, well, I didn't want to be a part of that, but some of our people did um, keep bringing it up with the Crown, and the Crown doesn't want to know. Why should they want to know? They work on white supremacy, although they deny that they do, but they do. They work on white supremacy and they don't want to know about Māori. Uh, so in 2021, we would start organising a Tiriti Convention for the country. And this is a stage where we start talking to the whole country about the need for constitutional transformation. And I have to say that I am just blown away by the number of Pākehā groups who are coming to us and saying, we want this done. We do not like the way our parliament operates. We do not like the dictatorship notion that we have in the country, it doesn't work for us, we need to do this stuff. So, you know, it's like gone viral. <laughs> was all approved uh, in, uh, by the forum in February 2016. Moana's and my goal is that by 2040, uh, we would have constitutional transformation and as I have said, I want my great-grandchildren to be able to say, what on earth was Nanny complaining about? Because everything will be balanced, everything will be lovely, and everything I'm complaining about will be gone. Okay, so, uh, some comments today. People do not want the unicameral model. The main discussion points, each Māori group Hapu Iwi will choose its own method of determining representation. For several of us who still live in our own traditional ways, in our whānau we have our own natural whānau spokesperson. We don't want a one man, one vote to try and disrupt what we already have. Others would prefer one man, one vote. Okay? Uh, fairly clear uh, opposition to political parties in a Māori body, and that's because we elect our people 
They go into Parliament, into a political body, and suddenly they don't represent us anymore, they represent their party. Well, you know, you've lost your representative. So our people were really clear about that, no political parties. Fairly substantial support for iwi, hapu, urban, and all those other groups uh, to be included. Considerable debate from which consensus has emerged that tikanga must underpin the Māori and Crown relationship. There are increasing Māori calls for constitutional transformation. As I say, our young people are just, they just blow me away the number of times I've heard them ask for it. Well, not that, they don't ask, by the way, they demand. And they say, if you, if you don't give us it, we're just going to do it anyway. Good on them. And growing support from some non-Māori groups, especially non-whites, but resistance from white supremacists. But they are being countered by support of Pākehā. White supremacy is a big problem in New Zealand, and it is not something that Māori can do anything about. It's their own that have to fix up. I, I consider white supremacy racism to be a disease, and it's not something that Māori can fix up. Only whites can fix up white supremacy. So, way and all. That's what we have to say about constitutional transformation. I think that's the end. That's yes, the end. it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to invite uh, you folks who have been listening to ask questions of uh, our experts here. What's going on in uh, Aotearoa with this whole many, many years they've been working on a constitution, very different from the kind of uh, constitutional arguments we've been having in Hawaii. You know, some of us got together in 2016 to write a constitution in one month, <laughs> and we thought we knew what we wanted because actually we'd been working on constitutions for a while. Um, my good, good friend, uh, Dr. John Osorio, who's now the dean of Hawaii New York here, was standing outside the gate holding a sign saying we shouldn't be doing a constitution. And I think what's come out of that is that we surely have differences of opinion, but let's do it with aloha, because he's still my really good friend. So we disagree but we don't have rancor. And I think when we're looking at how we proceed as a people, that's something I'd like to, to have us uh, think about. When we come to looking at what French Polynesia, uh, which really is Maui Nui, right, has been able to do in uh, the United Nations. You know, decolonization is a way for people to separate from the colonizer peacefully. But usually you have to have the colonizer agree before Ari Ihao came, I thought, wrongly, that France had agreed since you folks were in the process. And come to find out, they did not agree. They just didn't want to get outvoted, so they were outside the room. They left the room. I said, oh, that's an idea. So there's much to learn about all of this and to have a Polynesian cousin, our Tahitian cousin, to be at the table at the United Nations to speak from Maui Nui. Uh, I understand even some of the Rapa Nui people want to leave um, Chile and they want to come to, uh, they want to be part of uh, Maui Nui, just like you see various Polynesian peoples within Aotearoa wanting to be part of the, the Maori side of the world. How do we work on these things? And, and so what are your questions? Please, give us your questions. And if you want to be on uh, video, there's a microphone there, but if you don't, you can just talk story because we're kind of all in the family here. You want to know what the New Caledonians, what do you think about the New Caledonians not, not wanting to be independent, but want to say part of France? Yeah. Well, I will be very, uh, we're respectful with the, uh, our, our cousins, and their brothers, actually. We're partnering with them uh, for so many years, for six, 1970, 78, actually. Uh, well, they've been having their first referendum last year or two years ago, and uh, at the opposite of what uh, the poor France expected, which will be uh, way, way down, actually they've, they've reached for the first shot a 43%, which is really not bad. Actually, uh, Paris was shaking. There was an earthquake. Uh, and they actually expedite their French president in, in Numea just to calm down. Uh, so uh, 
they are having their second referendum this year. Yeah, uh, and they, these referendum are actually all under the UN scrutiny. So UN is actually uh, involved in this referendum. And uh, actually, it's, it's uh, well, we're hope, hopeful. It's, it's, you know, we, we thought it would be very difficult because most of the, the sovereignty movement in Kanaki, New Caledonia, lost their leaders. They've been assassinated uh, for, for some of them, mm -hmm. and most of them passed away. And uh, those who are, those who remain actually still on Ipa'a, but uh, they have to deal now with the UN and then to deal also with this referendum. Their main uh, challenge, uh, the main legal challenge was to, uh, well, actually, Kanaki was a colony of settlement. They've been actually sending out, the French were sending out all prisoners <laughs> all around France to uh, New Caledonia, to Kanaki. And this actually, they created a third social, uh, I would say, uh, category of people there that they call Kaldosh, that did not feel, no longer feel like being France or European, but of course not accepted by the Canucks. And they have the, the, the third group, which, is, which are the, the mainlanders, we'll say, or the Pakeha, the, the Popo'a. So there are three different. So it's really split it there. And it's, it's, very, it's very sad because it, sometimes it looks like apartheid system, really. Really, uh, but there's an accord. It's not something that has been forced. They signed an accord in 1988, and the accord, the accord, the document was, uh, the chart was signed by three parties and state of France, pro-France and pro-independence. And that accord was repeated in 1998, uh, which was you know, really implementing the process of decolonization, which is contrary of what we have in Tahiti. We don't want an accord. For us, the accord is a trap, really. Uh, but the accord in New Caledonia and Kanaki was really to bring back peace, because there was bloodshed there, really. Uh, some were executed, uh, some were killed in a cave. That even really remains the memory of the tribes of uh, Kanaki. So they are working hard. The only thing is, they, their, their, their main issue is how they will deal with the Wallis and Futunis. <laughs> They are uncertain as to they will vote for or against the referendum. And secondly, uh, the, the, the main issue is how to select those who are qualified to vote, the, the voters' eligibility, if I may. Uh, and there has been so much shenanigans from the French court to dispatch those who are able, those who are qualified, and those who are not. Uh, and this leads me really to another lesson that we've learned in Ma from Mahinui's side. It, it's risky, even a, we, we need to refuse any intervention of a judge from your own colonial power to decide or not if you, need, you can be independent. I would never see a judge from a colonial power judge and took a, take a decision against its own boss <laughs> at the end of the day. Sure. Unless he wants to to become a new judge for the new nation, <laughs> which is which is which is possible, so uh, so they've been losing people in Kanaki, and that actually combined with the uncertainty of the position of the Futunese, well in uh, Wallis people, and then with this, I would say, historical uh, apartheid. Uh, it's not bad to reach 43%. You only, they only need to reach 51. The critical mass is reached. So it's, it's really, yeah, we're hopeful for them, and I, we're pushing too. We have Taishans there, and we're advocating for that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow, I learned so much right now. I wish we need you have you as a professor at the uh, <laughs> University of <at> Manoa. <laughs> Questions?
Thank you. Thank you for your question. This is probably the most in, uh, repeated question that we have locally uh, every night <laughs> for, for, for the past few, few years now. Um, basically, it's uh, how are we able to convince that the, the option of independence is the right one? It's very emotional, number one, psychological, legal, and also it's basically it's a matter of uh, what you're going to do with your resources. Would you like the resource to become a French resource or a Mahuinu resource? As of now, the people in, Ma in Tahiti, especially in Tahiti, uh, even the whole country, uh, are not aware that uh, each second that we remain within the French Republic, we're losing money. Each second. France is using actually all our resources in collecting revenue every second, like like a clock. Every second, uh, collecting this 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 revenue upon our resources, without us knowing that these resources exist. We didn't know that the taxes, when when airplane crash crosses our our sky. We didn't know that there are revenue, passive income coming from the satellite signals. Every every hours that any geo, geo satellites will cross, stretch will cross our sky, and we number them. It's more than 700 satellites. Only two satellites represent one uh, on one year of budget of Mao Hinui. You know, 700 satellites. Only two of them represent one year of budget. If we own only one or two satellites, which Tonga does, with Tonga Sat, they, they, they understood the process. I'm just uh, talking about the satellites. But when you, when you also see uh, how, many, how many cable, optical cable are stretching on the seabed of, of the Pacific region, there are something like 20 cables. Who is collecting the money of that? When it, when, it, when it crosses your ocean, who? Who actually is competent to give the license? I've just shown you on the left side, these are the ones. <laughs> So we only have one cable that uh, actually uh, connects Hawaii to Tahiti, or Tahiti to Hawaii, which is property of our company, public company. And uh, the rest of the cable, all the licenses belong to Paris. And, and um, we discovered that the Japanese, in back in 2011, uh, unilaterally discovered a large amount, a large quantity of rare earth in the Marcus Island region between the Marcus Island and the Tuamutu. Uh, cobalt, world-class quality cobalt, manganese, nickel, platinum, rare earth to make, to make these things uh, working. Uh, and uh, it takes us back to the, the decision was of President de Gaulle back in 59. So we understand now. Now if we come back to that panel from the colonial power and the uh, territorial legislative power that actually all the money is collected on the left side. But these are, these are colonial powers, whereas all the work to be done to manage, steward <laughs> the resources are on the right side, which are actually in our hands. So people, when they think that they are free to govern themselves because they are governing the right side, they're wrong, actually. So our, our, our task is to convince them, to explain, to educate them peacefully. But it, it will take time. But we, are, we know that at the end of the day, we are right. Because if we were wrong, France will be in the room. Uh, since the very beginning, it will be there saying, OK, we understand your case. No, no, no. They will not be able to do so. So it's our, actually, it's our responsibility. It's a matter of taking responsibility. It's a matter of being inclusive. It's a matter of no longer being rude in our way of speaking to our people. It's a matter of drafting a inclusive constitution that will no longer fit what we've been crossing through, what we've been experiencing, uh, but that will reflect our Polynesian way of living. And we actually already draft something very beautiful not sure you know the concept of umete, of the hongi, you know, the, the oven 
in the earth when we cook. And that will be probably the spirit of our preamble. It, because we have an old saying in Tahiti that when, when people are coming by, passing by your house, you're not letting them go. You call them to come and eat. Always hospitality. This is what we call Polynesian Maohi Nui. So our constitution needs to be reflecting this value first. And for that reason, it's not going to be a repetition of France overseas uh, territory, like Tahiti at the center and the archipelago will be depending on, on Tahiti. Our, each archipelago needs to become a state with their own language. And it will be federated. Not as you understand the federal system, like within the US system, but our own federation. Not the Micronesia style either, uh, because it's really dependent to the US Congress. Our own way of federating our own states. So Marquesas will be one state. They will have their constitution, language, land, re tenure, resource, culture, very strong. The Wards Islands, Tuamutu, and all Australs. And I don't know about Papua Nui, but uh, they're also part of our people. But uh, it's up to them to decide. For our part, we will do our job. And when we present things this way, and we present, thing, we present a vision, and we present a value, and we present something that connect people together, they will just under, come start to understand. And, and, if we, and if we present th them the thing that the money actually is just drawing away by and collected by our colonial power, it will talk. It will really, really penetrate people. And that it's working. Because if we succeeded this in the UN, the best part, but the hardest part, will be uh, uh, at home. Does we have a similar uh, question for our own discussions in Hawaii about independence. How will we have medical? How will we have education? You know, where's the money going to come from? It's not coming from the United States. And I think uh, the, the question we really have to ask is how much will it cost? I want to know exactly how much it will cost for us to have free medical like they have in Tahiti. One time I went there and I got sick and I went to the hospital and it cost nothing. I couldn't believe it. Right, so how do, we, how, do we make, how do we find out what that costs? And how do we find out what Ari Iha was talking about? How much money are we not getting from, say, all the satellites that fly over us and the airplanes that come through here? How much money are we not getting? And what is that amount? So I think we need to have some, some real discussions about uh, economics before we uh, jump off into a political decision. We need to look at how much it'll, everything will cost. And how much education will cost for our people, and uh, can we do a better job than what America's doing now? Uh, those are the kind of questions we ask, I know, and I'm sure that's what's been going on in, in your country as well, right? Because when you have free medical, and when you live in a country that has no free medical like us, and where people don't usually have medical, can't go to have medical um, because we don't have enough money, then w you think, wow, you got it great there, you got free medical, what a nice colonizer you have. <laughs> But when you, as you say, when you think about how much money they're making off of your resources, what we need to make sure is that we know how to handle those resources as well, I think. So that's another. But other questions? Yes. Yeah, um, well, how should I respond to that? Yes, actually, um, uh, to be even even to be completed, our leader Oscar Timaru was supposed to be on that boat, the one who sank, who was bombarded, and uh, uh, only one soul left was a photographer, the Rainbow Warrior. 
but uh, he was supposed to be on the boat. He was preparing his, his you know, to, to, to oppose the resuming of the nuclear testing. And uh, yeah, and the, that French intelligence is still operating today. Hmm. Uh, and uh, of course in Tahiti. And uh, well of course we have to deal with that. Uh, are you think that deals, uh, that gravitates ar uh, around the nuclear issue? is under uh, close scrutiny. So uh, what we're doing now is that uh, we're acting smartly, smartly too. We're, we're learning, we have our own intelligence too. We're, yeah, we're starting to understand how they operate because you need to, to profile your uh, colonizer at the end of the day uh, also. I mean, they, know, they know that, they know that. Uh, uh, once we actually succeeded in released our country on the UN, it really just blast things that was blocking us. We then be become able to, uh, you know, leverage international uh, tools, treaties, and so on. Even though we're not qualified for the UN drip, yeah, we are just a nation in a building. It's it's even better, I would say, because they are now we are like in a in the in a room preparing to become a state. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's even better. Uh, yeah, it's uh, actually uh, Maui people is an indigenous people, but uh, it's a majority. It's, we're not be consider ourselves as a minority, uh, so we're we're a people for a state, and they should be the minority, <laughs> basically. Uh, uh, maybe someday they will become an indigenous foreigner, I would say, uh, and they should have their own embassies in our state. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good vision for us. Anyway, uh, regarding the nuclear testing and what happened in the past in New Zealand, this is something that the diplomacy has taken over. Uh, so now they are, the countries, those who are living and acting uh, in both sides of the diplomacy are now retired. So uh, uh, at the UN, at the Pacific Island Forum, and any other arena where France is you know, you know, getting close to Australia or New Zealand, they no longer talk about that. Yeah, it's like something that is wrongly, on from my personal view, uh, you know, engaged. Uh, today, um, they've made. Uh, we believe that our cousins, for the Pacific region, those who are in the Pacific Island Forum, I, 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 I clarify, have made a, a a very big mistake in letting us, Mauhinu and New Caledonia become a full member of the forum because this is what we've been asking for but in one condition after being independent but now everything that deals with all this, the left side of the story you know all the, the colonial powers uh, that is discussed within the pacific island forum it's not us that is speaking it's the french ambassador it means that actually we are becoming now, uh, at the moment, uh, the best stances for our colonial power within the Pacific region, under the blessing of the two uh, big players that I've cited. Uh, so the, uh, in, my, in a sense, they're just, it's like it, they're acting like they've forgotten the Rainbow Warrior uh, se uh, sequence. Uh, this is my personal view, of course. Uh, anyway, uh, we're still, discussing with uh, New Zealand and, and Australia in, in New York. We're still keeping connections. They've been supportive of the relisting. I can state it publicly. Uh, at least they were not being opposed. They were not likely to oppose. We've been uncertain <laughs> uh, as of their position, but uh, on the 17th of May, 2013, they've been okay, which is a great sign. Anyway, uh, today, uh, we know that the nuclear testing issue is not only a, a French Polynesia Maui Nui issue. And that lesson coming from the Rainbow Warrior sequence needs to stay in the mind of those who are still acting. And of course, President Temaru, who was supposed to, put on the, supposed to be on the boat, on the ship for the last crusade, uh, is still living. He's still our president in Tahiti. He knows, he remembers the, us very well of to pay attention to that. And this is what, this is the reason why he actually decided very hardly, courageously to uh, submit that communication. 
like like claim. It's a communication because it's our party that uh, did that uh, to the ICC uh, Prosecutors Bureau uh, in Netherlands. Uh, if any one of you guys needs to know about this, this communication, let me know. It's public. You know, the truth is inside. 60 uh, pages of truth regarding the history of the nuclear testing from the colonial side of it in Mauhinui since the beginning until today. And this is in the bureau of the prosecutor of the ICC now. So uh, the, tr the truth must be told. And, uh, and then our people is, was struggling for so many years uh, scaring about the intelligence of France that will block them in terms of being compensated, recognized as a victim, as, uh, whereas now it's every year at the UN an issue that is discussed, being discussed. I'm doing so, my colleague, President Temaru, sometimes when he comes to New York, we are addressing the nuclear issue in front of the whole world. This is really uh, something that, uh, that is an outcome from us, from our perspective, coming from the Rainbow Warrior period. Well, wonderful. I thank you so much for coming to us. Another question? Yes, go ahead, question. Okay, uh, <laughs> I won't be longer on the first question and then I'll be very cautious on the second one. Uh, by respect, by, res by deep respect. Uh, as I told the first day, uh, what's true for us is not necessarily true for others. And what was true for others is not necessarily true for us. That's, that's what guided us. So it's really a case by case situation even though we're connected by linkages, ancestral linkages, of course, uh, we need to profile the colonizer. And you have a very strong one over here. Very, very strong one. But they're a state. And you need to become a state and as, as equal one day. Uh, this is our hope from Tahiti. So what we did from our, from our end to, to gain consensus was, uh, I can tell that, <laughs> was to uh, choose the peaceful way. First, mm. no bloodshed. There has been no bloodshed to get our people relisted. No, absolutely no bloodshed, which was the case in Kanaki. It's a pain. Uh, they lost lives there. There was no life uh, lost on Ma from Mahinui's side. And the second one uh, is to always, like, Dr. Lili Kala said, uh, Kamil Eiva said, uh, being Arufa, you will need to respect uh, the opinion of the other Tahitians that do not share our views. One day, uh, because, and they're, and they're respecting ours too. But if we, you know, we succeed in the, in the, in the journey, in the process, they will be included. They will be included, and they know. Which means that now we can talk to them. It's not like we like terrorists with, uh, amongst us, like these are these wild people, and uh, these are the civilized people on one side, and the others, like us, uh, you know, coming from the jungle. It's no longer this way. Uh, so no bloodshed, a lot of arufa, 
a lot of respect between us. Uh, we have also that particular support coming from the churches, which is necessarily uh, uh, an influential way of, of, of uh, you know, gaining more and more exposure. Because what? Because from our point of view, uh, we've been consciously, the, the colonization was in the, con the consciousness. That's the, that's the French style of colonization. So the fight is not on the material, right? but we need to awaken, reawaken our people from a consciousness perspective on, on, you know, on the right, righteousness of our cause. So it needs to, to, to follow the rule of the consciousness. You can't be violent in the consciousness. And the church is playing its, uh, its a big role. As I remember the president of that church, who is a good friend, he may be looking at us, we're watching us, because he's very close to that, uh, that, that subject in Tahiti. He's the president of the Protestant Maori Church. He said, you know, uh, in the old times, in the old ways, uh, and I'm still repeating you guys in your party, the lightning still comes before the thunder. It means, yeah, the lightning comes before the thunder. Then you, you can know, you know, and then you wait the seconds between the lightning and the thunder. And you, s and you know if it is far or very close. Uh, the thunder represents the consciousness, the spiritual, the invisible. The no, the, 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 the lightning, I'm sorry, represents the, the invisible. And the thunder is the voice, the politics. I'd say, let's a people. Uh, so you need to be prepare first in the spiritual, and then it will be much more easier on the material. It's a great teaching that we have. And so uh, we recognize the position and the stance of the churches, and we also are Christians. Most, more, most of us, uh, are actually, actually, we are faith people. We, are, we have a free of freedom of faith, but uh, we recognize that it is needed to not just being uh, acting on the intellectual. This is what we, we, we actually have chosen to. And our leader, President Temaru, just always taught us, uh, and all the elders of the party, it is both. You need to act on both sides. When you want to convince, it's on both sides. You need to, we need to embrace both uh, reality. And, uh, and this is actually the, sec the first uh, the first dimension, lightning, is so much uncontrolled by your colonial power, whereas they can control your world, the visible world, but you can control, still control your invisible world. You know what I mean? Uh, so uh, it, it's another approach that we decided to have. And number three, uh, we, I would say, uh, we're still, we're still uh, trying to. Uh, act as if there's no change. There's a consistency since the beginning. Uh, uh, we, we need to be credible so that when, the, when you start something and you say something to, the, to, our, to your people, when we say something to our people, uh, next year we, we, we must not change it. We need to keep the cap, the cape until the end so uh, it means that you need to, <laughs> to really be specific and accurate first on the choice you make, and then after that, you're required not to change until the end. So the consistency of the party, of the movement that we represent, is, is recognized now. Uh, in the UN, they know who is Oscar Temaru. They know what is Tavini Huira Atira. They know that they've been, they've been there since 1978. They've been cr uh, facing the nuclear testing and now he's still there. And the releasing time, and uh, the releasing day, 17th of May 2013, he was in the room. And he's still acting for independence. You know what I mean? The cre this credibility, there's nothing that can replace that. All over the years, it needs to stay focused and consistent. And that is another way uh, to gain more and more inclusion. There will be always resistance, money, Money is making it, uh, it's an energy, 
and Moni is doing what probably you know also in Aotearoa, in Hawaii. It's, it's a very, very uh, volatile energy. Uh, and of course, most of the people today are you know, sticking by uh, what's the best choice regarding the money. Uh, but we believe that um, at the end of the day, Maui Nui, the body, the spiritual body, the, the physical body, the five million square kilometers of marine ocean, including the 118 island representing Maui Nui, has something to do in the Pacific region and probably in the world, and something probably to show to the world that when you face 193 shots of nuclear testing and you're still able to smile and to trust to your wellness, you're still able to trust into your nature, however it is contaminated, this is a way also to, 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 to show something else, resilience. And, and we would like to show that part of uh, human resilience to the world, and they understand that now. Of course, in Europe, it's much more difficult, but they're in the cold. <laughs> that's, they're, that's, for us, it's, uh, it's really uh, something that, you know, you have to put some magic. You have to put some momentum. There is an emotion between the freedom and the independence and the, move, the sovereignty movement. And when you, you need to keep that flame uh, so that people will just always look to the, to the light and say, okay, this is over here, this is over here. So I, I, I commend my elders, and I commend all the elders of different countries that are doing that job. It's very hard. It's very hard. It's what you call ingrate. It's you know, sometimes you're not thanked for that. <laughs> yeah, it's like in, ingratitude. Yeah, you you very rarely thanked for that, yeah. unless you're dead. <laughs> Yeah. It's a thankless It's job. a thankless mission. It's a thankless job, but it's a very respectable, noble, and expected. Because I believe that it's not only something that is come from today. It's our ancestors that are guiding us to do so. Thank you. Uh, for Maori, uh, again, all I can talk about is what we have done. So if you're wanting to build consensus amongst the people, what we've found is the colonizer did a very good job of dividing us in order to rule us and then denying who we are, trying to redefine us, get anthropologists and whoever to redefine who we are. So. To bring our people back together, what we found, the first thing you had to do was, one, try and restore the language, because within the language, that is key to who you are. But even more than that was to restore to the people their sense of identity, of who they really are. That, that's why the classes that Lili Kala does on the genealogies are so important because in, like in here in Hawaii at home your genealogies to set, decide who you are and you must know who you're or where you're connected to right the way around the country because there have been intermarriages all around the country. If you don't understand who you are then you can't function properly as a Maori in all of your different uh, iwi identities. So that was the first thing was to we had to give the people back the confidence of who they actually are. For that we decided our, our my father's generation decided that they had to retrain us again in all of our genealogies, all of our histories, not the ones that that the Pakeha said was our histories, but our own histories. So for, for my hapu, it's the fact that we come from Ra'iatea, from where Ari'iho comes from. And how did we come from there and, and what happened that made us come from there? All of the stories about who we are and why we ended up doing things we did. We also had to, um, knowledge is power 
and that, that became really clear to us. And when our people don't know who they are or what their rights are in that, it's very easy for the colonizer to come in and just drive huge wedges in amongst us. So it was not only about who you are, it's about what happened when the colonizer came here and really understanding exactly what he was doing when he came. And particularly, and I found it very helpful more recently for people to understand the doctrine of discovery and what that was about, that it is about white supremacy, it is about whites being able to go in and take over the countries of others and enslave people and exterminate people and just take charge of everything. That's white supremacy. Um, Pākehā in New Zealand don't like you talking about that sort of thing, but it's a reality. And unless you understand that reality, then you don't know how to deal with it. And that's what they've always relied on, is, well, you can't prove that we're racist. Well, actually, do the research. You can find out, and that's what we teach in the courses. Now, that's all very well in the university. Our people on the ground have to understand that. So what we did was we, when we had those original hui in the 1990s, we all said to each other, go home and run, we call them wānanga, but they're like workshops where you bring the people up to speed and you ask them who come to your wānanga to go home and teach their children and teach their grandchildren. Let them know who they are, what their history is, what their rights are, because most Māori had no idea of what they were. That empowers them, so that when you have an issue that comes up, you can pull on all of that in order to make a decision about the issues. But if you're asking them to make a decision based on what the colonizers told them, all we do is end up at each other's throats, and we're fighting with each other all the time because we're trying to operate, I don't know, with half a foot in the colonizer's world and a quarter of a toe in another world, and we really don't know what we're doing. But if we root ourselves really firmly in who we are and what our real history is, then suddenly the issues when they come before us are a lot clearer. And so we find it easier to deal with them. Now, issues are often very hard that come before you. If you don't let the people talk and talk and talk until they've run out of talk, then they will always keep coming back because they, they, we, we talk about kua tau te whakaro, when the mind is settled, you must allow everybody's mind to settle on the issue if you want consensus. If the people are still wanting to argue about it, you let them keep arguing. You don't try to cut off. I've, this is what is so crazy about the Pākehā way of doing things. You've got to have everything done by two o'clock on such and such a date, <laughs> and the report must be in at such and such a date. And we say, no. The report or the decision will come in when the decision is made and we will not adhere to your Pākehā timelines to do it. We will make the decision in our own time because that decision is a decision that will hold because the people would adhere to it because it's their decision. Now, the other thing that I learned when I was very young was never go into a hui where a decision is needed to be made with your own mind made up about how that decision is going to be made. You must go in with an open mind because if you don't go in with an open mind, you can't hear what everybody else is having to say. Mm -hmm. And when everybody has put everything in, then you can clear your mind to make a decision. And that's another thing that Pākehā do. They will go into a meeting with a fixed position and they'll fight for that position. And Māori in that same room will go, well, actually, I want to hear what everybody has to say. And they said, why do you want to hear that? Don't you know what it is you want? Well, no, not until I hear everything. That's, and that's how you build consensus. And so you don't have this adversarial thing where I'm going to do it my way and there's no other way. 
You're never going to get it that way. So it, it takes a great deal of patience, but so long as you've got the knowledge, the confidence, and you know who you are, and you know how to make the decisions, you'll come out with a consensus. It'll never be on the hard issues. It will never be quick. It'll be slow. It doesn't matter. Just let it happen. So that was the first one. And then the strategies you employ, um, Moana Jackson's one who can tell you this. Moana Jackson is a walking example of the strategies you use. Your leaders must always be open to be answerable to their people. And the people will ask their leaders what some would consider to be silly questions. A leader must always answer the questions, any and every question that they're asked. No matter how insulting it is, no matter how stupid it may seem to the rest of the people, a leader will always answer to their own people. If they don't, at home, they get tossed out. You have to have huge amount of patience, and I think you have to be a bit crazy, actually, to be. <laughs> <laughs> but that, those strategies, because what my old people taught me is that if the people put you in the position of a leader, it's because they see that you have a great love for your people, great aroha for your people. If you have aroha for your people, aloha up here, if you have aroha for your people, they are never a heavy load to carry. They are always very light, but they ask you to be very accountable and to be theirs, so your life is not yours anymore, okay? And you're right, you, you, you're often in that position, get attacked, but you must always be able to answer. You know, if the, the attack is a fair criticism, a good leader accepts that criticism and makes the changes that need to be made. And there will be those. Uh, and then you get the others, of course, who will, as I've seen in my case, uh, usually when I get attacked, there'll be others who come along. I never say a word. All the others come and say it. That's when you know whether you've got it right, when the others do it for you. Because the responsibility for the leader being in place is the people's responsibility. If the people have made a mistake, then it's for the people to fix it up. Okay? I don't know if that answers your question. But <laughs> okay. That's what we do at home. Mahalo nui loa. We're supposed to be pau by 8.30 here. So I'd like to ask the OED TV. Thank you so much, OED yeah. TV for actually uh, supporting uh, this whole effort for the Brent chair, for Auntie Gladys Brent's memory, her vision of us having a comparative Polynesian studies that we learn from each other. I wanna thank Haile Hawaiian Food for all the good food that they make for us every night. I, I wanna thank all of you for coming, uh, but also I would also like to thank Kavika Aspili yes. and Maka yes. for helping us so much make this event come about. And um, so I would like to say hello to all of you folks. We will have shortly, probably within the next two weeks, a website called the um, Kamakakuo Kalani Brandt Archive. And we're gonna send that out far and wide to everybody who is hopefully will post it on OEV TV so that you can see where the, the PowerPoints are, where the various, um, uh, audio, uh, various uh, tapes are, the vi videotapes as well as audio tapes, and what are the documents that we have that go along with these lectures. So they'll all be there at that website. It just um, takes a little bit to get the university to agree to websites these days, so we're trying to work as quickly as we can, but we, we, we're dedicated to that. And you see it on TV, you see it on OB TV, you know that it's true. Thank you very much. Aloha. <laughs>